Good evening. This is the Digital Age, and I'm Jim Zirin. Tonight's show is about the transformation of the mainstream media over the past 40 years. What have been the defining changes? In the past, we've asked the question, will the internet kill print journalism? Tonight, we examine whether the net has not upstaged conventional TV journalism. And our guest tonight is someone who has seen it all. He is Garrick Utley. Uh, he was a news anchor at NBC for 30 years, mm -hmm. later at ABC and CNN. He's covered such seminal events as the handing down of Roe v. Wade, and indeed covered the first hours of the tragedy of 9-11. From 1989 to 1991, he was the host of Meet the Press, preceding mm -hmm. Tim Russert. Garrick Utley, welcome. Thank you. Now, you are now the president of the Levin Graduate Institute of International Relations and Commerce at SUNY, uh, mm -hmm. State University of New York. And you are also the author of a book, you should have been here yesterday, <laughs> A Life in Television News. What a career. A long career uh -huh. in television news and journalism in the heydays uh, or golden age of the networks and then what has followed. and, and delighted to have a sort of a second life now in the academic world, building an institute which really deals with the key aspects of globalization, what's happening in our world. Uh, now, Garrick, your book has an engaging title which uh, resonates with our subject. You should have been here yesterday. Uh, where does that title come from? It comes from a lunch, I forget, with some colleagues when foreign correspondents in the days when we covered the world for the networks or newspapers when the budgets were there. And we were having lunch one day, I don't know if it was in Beirut or somewhere, and we, journalists started to talk about, well, if one day we get around to writing that book, assuming the world is waiting with bated breath to learn of our own personal experiences, which is not necessarily the case, what would we call it? And I, the idea came to me, you should have been here yesterday, because that's what journalists say to each other when one of their colleagues arrives a day late. So that's where the title came from. Garrick, you should have been here yesterday. yesterday. Now, you've been in the business for uh, over 40 years. Uh, your roots were in broadcast journalism. I they? grew up in Chicago, uh, on the south side of the University of Chicago campus area. My father was from there and met my mother at the university. They both went into uh, public affairs. My father was in international affairs. He was the director at, uh, in the 1930s of the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations and started commenting on the news before there were news services. In the build-up to World War II, uh, radio commentators became very important. They were the only source of news on the radio. There were really no foreign correspondents until Edward R. Murrow started um, in the, on the eve of World War II. And so I really got that uh, long before I was born, I guess. It was in the DNA. And then afterwards, of course, he worked in radio and in the early days of television. So I learned by osmosis. Yes. Well, this DNA mm -hmm. evolved, and when you were 24 years old, something quite dramatic happened to you. You went to uh, Vietnam. I was very fortunate. I, after my uh, studies in the United States in the early 60s, I spent a year in Europe in the graduate school in Berlin. And after that, I was hired by uh, John Chancellor, who was the NBC correspondent in Brussels. I was hired. He paid me $62.50 a week to make his coffee and learn about journalism. And the reason he was there and the reason I was hired and my great good uh, stroke of, of fortune was that I joined just as the network, CBS and NBC, were launching the half-hour evening newscast. They were expanding it from 15 minutes. And that really, which was, was in September of 63, was the start of what became known and what is today the half-hour evening newscast. In the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, they dominated. They were really the only source of national and international news. And of course, since then, with the rise of cable television and now the internet, we've had fragmentation. But I was fortunate at a young age of 23 to, do, uh, to join NBC as the office assistant, then went to Vietnam at the start of the war in the summer of 64, just before the Gulf of Tonkin crisis, and spent a year and a half there during the whole period of the American escalation. And that was a tragedy, but it got me launched. Now, how do you co uh, did you cover the Gulf of Tonkin crisis? Uh, there's no satellite dishes. You couldn't have a live the feed Viet from the, the Vietnam War and those. There are two things that were very interesting. On the one hand, it was, it was very primitive. It was called television's first war. I mean, there had been some film of the Korean War, but Vietnam was really the first time when the reporter with the camera, with the sound of the camera, so you could capture the voices of the soldiers and the civilians, 
could bring the story and the emotion and human emotion associated with it into American living rooms. So in that case, it was television's first war, the tremendous impact. No, there are no satellites. We worked with film. We started black and white, and then in 1965 went to color. And uh, I fought very hard. I was one of the pioneers in convincing the networks we had to have lightweight sound cameras so we could capture the voices. Silent footage with a reporter's voice over or narration mm -hmm. didn't have nearly the impact of, of the actual sounds of war from coming from people themselves. And we did that. But then we took, we'd have to write our scripts. We never developed the film. We had to take notes of what shots had been made from the cameraman. Write a script recorder, put it all in the big bag, put it on a Pan Am 707, and 48 hours later it was on the air in the United States. So there was this 24 to 48 hour delay. What we did have, though, is long before there was the term embedding journalists in uh, military units, we had it in the sense that if we were accredited correspondents, we could go out with American units anywhere in the war. We lived with them. You could spend a few hours, you could spend several days with them. They loved to have us. When we had our story or decided it was time to leave, we could go out on a helicopter. So although we didn't have the, the technical sophistication of live satellites, we had this direct contact. And that, too, having this ability to be with the military units in combat or down in the Mekong Delta with the civilians, wherever we were, gave these reports that immediacy and that impact. And that was historic, a uh, major first step in TV news. And you had no producer with you? In no the producers, field. no. It was the, the team was the reporter, the correspondent, and a camera person, and occasionally a sound person who would carry the sound recording device. Now, uh, of all the stories you covered of the Vietnam War, and there were many, uh, uh, which uh, do you uh, recall most vividly? Well, there were, I was there three times. I was there for a year and a half at the beginning, and there were a number of incidents or battles there, the arrival of the American forces in uh, early uh, 64, obviously, uh, 65, sorry, was, was a seminal event. I was back there for the Tet Offensive. Uh, after it was launched, not the first days, but there for several weeks. But the most searing memory was the fall of South Vietnam in 75. I was not there on the final day, but I was there through the whole weeks leading up to it. And to experience not just the, the circle being completed or the disaster taking place with the fall of South Vietnam, but to be able to experience firsthand as a human being as well as a journalist how a system, a society can collapse. And they can collapse. And that's what happened. And that image of the last of the Americans and Vietnam the fall of Saigon, yes. going off in the helicopter really symbolized what that was. Now, uh, at that time, you must have worked with some of the legendary journalists mm. of, uh, of your time, and particularly print journalists, uh, as well as uh, well, television journalists. Well, a number of them. David Halberstam, of course, had left just when I had arrived, but Morley Safer arrived for CBS. I was the first permanent NBC reporter in uh, station permanently in Saigon. Morley arrived a few months after, about six months after I was there. Uh, Peter Jennings would come in and out. Uh, there were a number of others, uh, Bernard Kalb and other names we all know today. And it was quite, it was a small group at first and then it grew gradually. But what, also what I remembered, and I, people talk about the Iraq War and what happened here, and although there are different situations, I draw a certain parallel between the two in that the journalists in Vietnam were sending back reports before the American troops came in saying, watch your step. Mm. Uh, this is not a war we're gonna win militarily. It was about the hearts and minds of the people. The Saigon government was ineffective and a corrupt government, and um, the outlooks were very bleak. But Word to the wise wasn't sufficient. sufficient. And, but the public here went along with the president, Lyndon Johnson, until proven otherwise there was no light at the end of the tunnel. That happened after the Tet Offensive in 1968, the public opinion turned. And we saw something similar in Iraq, where you went in, you supported the president. Yes, there was early successes, and then as the public watched what was happening, it turned. And of course, the Iraq War went on much longer than the, um, the Vietnam War. Yes, I think what you've been describing uh, is basically a, a TV news revolution mm -hmm. uh, in uh, reporting news, mm -hmm. particularly reporting war news. Uh, but let's talk about the internet. Is there mm -hmm. now an internet revolution that may be uh, well, there's a di there's a digital. News? There's a digital revolution. I think we have to be careful about this. We've gone through various phases. We had, uh, if you go back, um, well, 
not to be too pedantic about it, but I often ask people talking about this, what's the most important technological invention of the 20th century? And people say nuclear energy or antibiotics. And I say it's always right in front of us and we pay no attention and you're worrying it right now and I'm worrying it right now. It's this thing. You tap it. It's called a microphone. Until the microphone came along with radio, with telephones, it was one person con uh, communicating with one other person. Microphone made it one to many. At first it was limited in terms of hands of very few people, presidents, prime ministers, newscasters, etc. And then it started to spread with radio. And it was analog technology and then more people could listen, but the microphones were still in one hand. Then television came along, added pictures, but still analog, one speaking to many. Then you started to get to leap forward to the 1990s with the advent of cable television, not the advent, but cable TV reaching critical mass, and that was CNN, and then the other news channels piling on. And then on top of that, you got your digital uh, technology and the ultimate fragmentation of the Internet. So if you take all of these together, it's a natural progression. It's the progress or the advancement of technology. And to come back to your specific question, yes, it, digital technology, of which the Internet is one part, changes everything. What do you mean by the fragmentation of the Internet? The fragmentation, well, we started in television, for example, with two major news uh, networks, NBC and CBS, and ABC came along later. But as long as we, we had a duopoly and then an oligopoly, basically controlled the market. So we, were, we never paid much attention to the ratings because we were close to each other, NBC, CBS, ABC at first trailed. Because if there are only three people in the game as sharing the pie, the pie was so large that everybody was making the money. Once you got into cable, that, par, that pie started to be cut in smaller pieces, particularly in the 90s and even more so today. Once the Internet came along, you're siphoning off consumers of information or entertainment of images, and the slices get even smaller. So that's the fragmentation, and of course the Internet carries it to the ultimate degree of people just going wherever they want for their information, which means they don't have to get the news on the nightly news. That's not been the case for years. They can get any kind of information um, instantly. Um, even though the, I'd be interested to know what's happened to the Encyclopedia Britannica, for example, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Wikipedia or just Google search. So as you have created through digital technology the infinite number of sources of information and the infinite amount of power given to the consumer of that information and or entertainment, you have ultimate fragmentation. and. We're still at the beginning of this process. Well, would this be an example? I mean, I certainly used to get uh, all my news at, on the nightly news on television. But uh, just a few months ago, as you know, uh, a plane went down in the Hudson River. Uh, and uh, those in my office heard about it. And they all went to their computers mm -hmm. and watched in real time uh, footage of the passengers on the wings and of the mm -hmm. rescue operation. It was all very exciting. Mm -hmm. And by the time the whole thing was over, I'd be very much surprised if any of them watched television at night. Uh, they'd already digested there's the no, in, entire happening. Absolutely right. And that's the challenge that the NBCs and the CBSs and the ABCs face. It's the similar challenges that newspapers, the New York Times, which is only a few blocks away from that uh, plane went down in the Hudson River, faces. So what do they devote to their website, uh, their digital New York Times, and what do they devote to the paper edition? Well, they've learned, like everybody else, you've got to put it out there on the digital platform, the website. And I think on the whole, we're better served, like as you and your colleagues were, because you could just go to your computer and watch it immediately. Yes, well, the New York Times website has evolved mm -hmm. as well because uh, you not only get uh, the front page of the, the, uh, uh, of the print paper, uh, but uh, you also get updates on the stories. You get new stories as uh, they occur, and then there's a video feature. It's uh, all there. So it's all there. It's all there, and there, is a, uh, there are many instances of this on the New York Times site or other sites but one that I noticed particularly a while back when they had the terrorist attacks in Mumbai and the terrorists were in the hotel holding hostages and the Times website had one column which was their reporter in Mumbai reporting as a journalist does from outside trying to assemble all the facts as they were known and in the next column were the emails and the instant messaging from people inside the hotel telling and reporting what they were doing. So here you saw the two kinds of news reporting. They're traditional, where the fellow was close to the story but not in the story, 
and a mosaic of reports from people who were in the middle of the story, the tragedy, inside the hotel. Now, they complemented each other. The reporter amplified the bits and pieces that were happening inside, but by far the more compelling reading at that time was to see what people inside the hotel in Mumbai were sending out. Now, with all this uh, footage in real time of, uh, of actual happenings, uh, there still is, uh, in the country, great distrust for the media. Uh, not only distrust for the commentary or for the bias of, of news reporting, uh, but uh, distrust actually about the images. I mean, it was CNN showing more body bags of uh, Palestinians or more body bags of Israelis, and, uh, you know, which is uh, the more horrific, and, and, w and what about the slant? And now, and recently, we've had this uh, spat between Sarah Palin and the media, the spat between Michael Steele and Rush Limbaugh. I mean, why is uh, the media being harpooned for all the ills of our society? Because the media is visible and plays such a central role in our life and in our society. Let's just distinguish between a couple of things. First, the power of images, very powerful. That's what we saw in Vietnam. And what you saw is the combat scenes and the scenes of injured U.S. Uh, the GIs were seen, uh, shown in American living rooms. People said, well, what's the limit? What should one do? What's in proper taste? What's patriotic, et cetera? But the interesting thing, and this is a well-known um, study and research that was done, that the images did not change people's opinions so much as reinforcing existing opinions. If you saw an American GI setting fire to somebody's home in the Mekong Delta, if you were a real hawk, you said, well, it's too bad, but that's what you got to do to win the war. If you were a dove against the war, they said, oh, this is inhuman. You can interpret it the way you want to, and that exists today. The other, that's the images. The other part is, is the role of opinion and the pontificating or the bloviating, call it what you will, and how that has emerged. In the one hand, that is not entirely new. If you go back to the old radio commentators, the few that you had, my father was probably an exception who was really an analyst, in the 1930s, before the Ed Murrows and the others, and you study them, and you'll find that they had their 15-minute newscasts, and they were filled with their personal opinion. And it comes back to the point that we, as the consumers of information and of news, are going to have to become more and more the editors of what we consume. Our generation looked to editors of newspapers, television executive producers, to be the gatekeepers to judge what we should be consuming. We granted them that role. Now we have to become the editors and decide what we're going to consume, and the, people are doing this. This is the new media. No, uh, new media. no gatekeeper, uh, no uh, uh, editing of, uh, of content. Uh, yes. It's all there for people to pick, up. pick and choose. And we will choose. This is classic First Amendment, the marketplace of ideas. Well, it's, it's a classic First Amendment, and it is an unstructured environment. We're losing just about most of the structures, not all, but uh, the traditional structures are being eroded. There will continue to be a New York Times. There will continue to be networks. There will continue to be places you can go to. That's not going to disappear. But there is the, the noise that is there. And in some ways in society has always been there. I mean, if people, maybe people watching this uh, program are like classical music. And you know the great composers of the 18th and 19th centuries, the Mozarts and the Verdis and the Wagners and what have you, Richard Strauss's. Okay, um, that's what we know today. But that wasn't the only music in those days. People were having all kinds of music. It was never being recorded or written down or kept. But yes. the people didn't go around humming Mozart. Everybody, you know, on, on the farms of, of Austria uh, or Europe in the late uh, 18th, early 19th century. So it, it, it's what we're having now is just what probably was always there in terms of opinions. It's just out there, and we cannot hide from it. Let's talk about the commercialization mm -hmm. uh, of news on mm -hmm. television. Now, commercialization has always been with us. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we have a video of mm -hmm. John Cameron Swayze mm -hmm. uh, when uh, he uh, was uh, finished uh, reporting the news. Uh, he, uh, uh, well, let's watch. Well, that's the story, folks. Say, do you have a few uh, last-minute gifts? If you do, remember camels in this gay, colorful Christmas carton. Glad we could get together. Well, that doesn't happen anymore, but we see now multiple sponsors of uh, news programs. Now, do you think that has an impact on the objectivity of uh, 
of the reporting? Well, there are two different things. First, this wonderful blurb, which I used in a video in connection with my book. When I saw that, it just leapt out uh, before Christmas, I believe, of 1950. And because that program, the original NBC Camel News Caravan, and this is really historic trivia, uh, the model there was produced for Camel cigarettes by NBC News. Camel paid for the show. They had their name in the title of the show. And that was the coal, what they called the Camel News Caravan. One sponsor. One sponsor. That continued into the early 60s when the half hour, but when the half hour show started, they were too expensive. One sponsor couldn't pay for the whole show. And that's where we got into the 60 second commercials, these three or four commercial breaks loaded with um, anti deodorant and um, dental floss advertisements mm -hmm. and things like that. So, yes, it is better that you have multiple sponsors. No one sponsor really could. Con control of the program. And the uh, Camel, uh, the advert, this is a little anecdote, but I was told by one of the original producers, there are only uh, two editorial restrictions, uh, three, that they imposed on NBC and NBC agreed to. One, they could not show in the program a no smoking sign. Second, they couldn't <laughs> show a live camel, because <laughs> a real live camel was sort of an ugly animal. And third, they couldn't show any cigars. And when Winston Churchill returned as prime minister with a cigar in his hand, uh, NBC went to the Camel Advertising Agency and said, can we show Winston Churchill with a cigar? And they said, yes, in his case, you can make, him, you can make an exception. An exception for Churchill. Right. Well, that's a marvelous story. Uh, what about uh, corporate ownership of the networks, which we didn't always have? You have uh, ABC owned by Disney, NBC by GE, uh, CNN by AOL. Uh, do you think that's a good fact or a bad fact? I think, well, you prefer to maybe not to have the dominant media companies, but there were always dominant media companies. NBC was owned by RCA, which was a large company. Uh, CBS was Bill Paley's company, and he owned it. Uh, they had other divisions. Television was the dominant part. Uh, the night all happened in the middle to late 1980s that the larger companies uh, took over the, um, the broadcast um, entities or networks. I don't think that itself has been a bad thing at all. In some cases, they were able to help with resources. I think by far the greater impact was just coming from the changing marketplace that we discussed earlier, that it was the competitive pressures that were going to dictate what you were going to cover or show in as you became more, let's be frank, desperate to attract and hold an audience than what a corporate um, uh, leader was, was saying. We're thinking. And uh, another possibly uh, corrupting factor mm -hmm. has been uh, TV journalism as entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, anchors have become virtual celebrities. Uh, they uh, go to parties and hobnob with the people they cover. Uh, do you see this as? Uh, uh, as adversely impacting uh, honest But uh, it's not reporting. new. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, in a way. There's uh, a danger in maybe, it. Maybe, yes, there's a danger. Maybe journalists should be like members of a priesthood and we go to our cells in the monasteries at night and eat gruel or and soup. Um, we'll let you get married. Then, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, on the other hand, you're a good point. On the <laughs> other hand, um, this has always been the case, particularly in Washington. If you're a journalist or a columnist going back to the 20s and 30s, you're hobnobbing and interacting with your sources of information. And Washington in particular is a place that if you're a leading journalist with a leading publication, you have special access. But you want to maintain that access. And there are very real ethical questions there as to how close you get to your subjects. I don't think that's new. I think what is new is through our sort of celebrity journalism today or publications, you just see a lot more of this going on because everything is much more visual. But the basic issue is not a, a new issue. Now, on the opinion side, that goes back to what we were discussing also. You are desperate to get attention. And how do you hold attention? By getting people who share your opinions or beliefs to come into your tent and be with you. or. You put two people up uh, who have opposing views, and you create heat and conflict through debate or shouting matches, or whatever. So you're using some of the basic theatrical, if you will, yes, um, entertainment, yes, uh, but also very basically rooted in human behavior, yes, uh, techniques in order to attract and hold an audience. Now, I don't like that. I think the public does, it suffers it. The public has the right to change the channel or turn it off. But 
and look at the size of the audiences you're getting on cable, they're small. But cir so circling back, that would apply to the internet as well, would it not? Uh, yes, it would apply to the internet. Yeah. But just to take one example, um, and some of this is not reported uh, in a full extent, um, talk, people talk about a Rush Limbo, and everybody talks about yeah. Rush Limbo. Let's say he has, what, 16, 18 million listeners, what they call a cum, which means somebody who listens to him for at least 15 minutes once a week. And people say, oh my God, it's all the right-wing talk show guys, and I don't listen to them, that's not my cup of tea. But if you go to public radio and take their morning program, Morning Edition, or All Things Considered in the Afternoon, their audience exactly the same. But we don't see it that way, and the press doesn't write it the way. Oh, everybody on radio is on the right wing like Rush Limbaugh, but public radio has a very large audience, just as large in many ways, which reflects how the nation is divided. Garrick, I'm afraid we'll, we yeah. have to wrap up. Okay. This has been just marvelous, yeah. and I have a question for you. Yeah. Has the net upstaged TV journalism? Yes, it is upstage TV journalism. It is changing journalism. I think the bottom line is we're better. We, first of all, we can't change or stop technology and shouldn't try. I think as a society, we are much better off because of much freer and broader and deeper access to information dash news than we had before when it had to go through a limited number of gatekeepers, including me and my colleagues, that you can no longer put a lid on the flow of news. That alone means we're living in a better world, a more informed world in many ways, despite all the noise, which is pretty unpleasant. More informed world. Yeah. Thank you so much. Pleasure. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more on the digital age. For the digital age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.